Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a guy who eats Honeycrisp and Jameson for dinner. Here is the captain. And I'm all out of Honeycrisp. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very excited to be featuring Magic Hobo Monkey Juju Juicy IPA from the good folks at Meadowlark Brewing. Legend tells of a mystical transient who would gift the world's greatest IPA in exchange for one's immortal soul. A profound citrus blast followed by otherworldly soft mouthfeel. And that is how the legend goes. This is Magic Hobo Monkey Juju Juicy IPA from the good folks over at Meadowlark Brewing Company. Garage grade four and a half bottle caps out of five. And let's give some praise and thanks to our friends that helped us fill up the fridge for this week's shows. First up, a big cheers to Patrick from Lake Mary, Florida. And a big We Like You chip goes out to Tammy from Wichita, Kansas. And last but certainly not least, we have Ryan H. in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, everyone we just mentioned, they went to True Crime Garage, clicked on the pint glass, and donated to this week's beer fund and helped us out with this week's beer run. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, B W E W R U N beer run. Whatever social media platform you like, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, join us, follow us, engage with us at True Crime Garage. And that is enough of the biz. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. On the morning of Friday, August 11th, 1995, in Grants Pass, Oregon, a young man walked into the police station. He was disheveled. He appeared to be very tired and dirty. He said to the attendant at the four service desk that he needed to speak with a police officer. He then took a seat in one of those chairs near the little window that separates walk-ins from the nice lady at the desk on the other side. He waited briefly, and then an officer appeared and asked the young man, what is it that you would like to report? What the young man had to say was going to take much more work than just another incident report. He started to tell the officer about last night. The officer quickly walked the young man back into the office portion of the police station. 
He took the young man to a small interview room. Inside, there was a small table, three chairs, and nothing else. The officer gestured toward one of the chairs and told the young man to have a seat. Then, he asked him if he would like something to drink, maybe a water or a soda, or perhaps something stronger like a coffee. The young man replied, soda, followed by a simple thank you. The officer left the room and closed the door behind him. The young man could hear the door click in a manner that suggested that he would not be able to just stand up and walk out of the room. This door would need to be opened from the outside. There were no windows to the outside world in this little room, but instead one small reinforced window that looked out into the small white hallway that the two had just passed through on their way to the interview room. The young man could see the officer talking with two men through the shatterproof window. The two men were not in uniform. They were in suits, both sporting big, wide ties that stretched the length from their necks down to their belt buckles. At first, the men in the suits looked confused, and then they both nodded their heads simultaneously. The group of men then quickly broke from their huddle. The officer and one of the suits turned and moved in the direction that the young man had just come from. The other suit turned toward the door. Then, the young man heard the click of the door, and it opened up. A tall man in a suit introduced himself. He's a detective, and said that the officer will be back in a minute with a soda, followed by, I hope Dr. Pepper is okay. The detective closed the door. He moved one of the chairs, so now there is a chair on each of three sides of the small table. The detective sat down directly across from the young man and said, So, I understand you are here to tell us about something that happened. The young man agreed. The door clicked again and opened. This time, it was a woman entering the room. The room seemed to shrink smaller every time someone entered. The woman was wearing a pantsuit. She was holding a clipboard and a can of Dr. Pepper. She handed the soda can to the young man and sat down in the chair. On the side of the table that separated the young man from the already seated tall male detective, she said, So, tell us about last night. The young man was 17-year-old Nikolaus McDonald. He repeated the statement that he had made to the officer just minutes earlier that led him to where he was now, seated and nervous in a tiny room with two detectives. He said that last night he witnessed and participated in a murder, and everything that he was going to tell them took place just a few hours before. The 17-year-old would go on to tell detectives how he watched and participated in three murders. Three brutal murders that were committed by he and his best friend and now blood brother, Brian. This is Israel's son, the Bissett family murders, and this is True Crime Garage. Where we pick up our story, Captain, it's Friday morning between the hours of 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. Going into the afternoon, the police at Grants Pass are going to have their hands full. Here we have this young man who sits ready to open up one horrific can of worms. And the story that 17-year-old Nikolaus McDonald had to tell went something like this. It all started late Thursday night with a plan for premeditated murder. He implicated his 16-year-old best friend, Brian Bissett, as the mastermind for this plan. In fact, he had not known that Brian would be even capable of such evil deeds. He said his friend had been kicked out of his parents' house for some time. This was due to several reasons, but for now, we will call it behavior problems. He continued saying that he and Brian Bissett went to Brian's parents' home. This was at approximately 1230 in the morning. The plan was to break into Brian's parents' house. This is a two-story home. McDonald said that they cut the phone lines to the house, and this was planned before they got there. 
Then he watched as Brian climbed a ladder up to the second story where Brian would gain access to the house via a second floor bedroom window. I believe this may be Brian's old bedroom that he's climbing into. This is meant to be a home that would be occupied by five people. So we have Brian's parents, which are 42-year-old Michael Bissett, 40-year-old Wendy Bissett, and one of Brian's older sisters, 18-year-old Stephanie, and Brian's brother, which is five-year-old Austin. But on this night, there would only be three people occupying that house. As we said, Brian, he had been kicked out of the house, and his sister Stephanie, who's 18, she was away. Thankfully, she was out of town for a softball tournament. So on this night, there were three members of the Bissett family occupying the home and one member of the family climbing up a ladder seeking revenge in its coldest of forms. McDonald says that he waited anxiously outside where he heard shouting. Then he heard gunshots, then silence, and then he heard more gunshots. Then once again, silence. Seconds later, his friend Brian was outside. In a voice that can only be described as some kind of hushed shouting, Brian explained that he needed McDonald to come inside, saying, I shot him, meaning his dad. I shot him, my dad, but he is still alive. I'm not sure about my mom, but I need you to go inside and finish them off. Nicholas went into the home. As he was walking through the home, he saw blood and he could smell the gunpowder. Brian told him that after he entered the house, his father, Michael, confronted him. They argued before Brian fired shots at his father. Brian said he was able to hit his father with several of these shots. Michael, the father, staggered outside of the room and then fell. The shots must have alerted his mother because his mom, Wendy, came charging up the stairs with a baseball bat in her hands. Without even one single second thought, he then turned the gun on her and fired several times. Now, Brian and McDonald reach the room where Brian's parents lay dying. To their surprise, Brian's brother Austin was in the room. He was kneeling with his hands pressed up against the bodies of his parents. He was attempting to shake them. He must have thought that they were sleeping or something. Of course, Austin is crying, and he's now covered in blood. It's hard for me to decide here, Captain, if Brian had thought this part through, right? I think that he and McDonald went there, went to the home with the intention of killing the parents and a general plan to carry that out. But I wonder and could not find confirmation of such. Did they know going to the house? Or did they know when they were creating this plan that they were just going to kill whoever else was there? It seems like the conflicts that he was having was just with his parents, not his family. And obviously his brother is very little. So what kind of conflicts would you be having with him anyway? Right. And then you have to wonder, too, Stephanie's not there that night. Did Right. Did he go there on this night because he knew his sister was gone or... Because he had been kicked out of the house, he's been out for some time. There's conflicting reports on how long he had been kicked out of the house. You have to then wonder, would he have even known that Stephanie would not be home that night? And again, whoever happens to be there is who could end up being a victim that night. Right. Because there are some pre-offense behaviors that suggest that maybe the only intent was to kill mom and dad, but... There are some post-offense behaviors and actions of the killers that I believe indicate otherwise, and we can get into that post-offense behavior after we get through the rest of McDonald's confession here. Now, one of the pre-offense behaviors is the attempt to muffle the sound of the gunshot. So this is an indicator to me. There, there, there's conflicting reports. Okay. One thing I could not figure out. And even after going through the trial and some of the transcripts that were available for the actual trials that, that would take place much later, some information states that they went there with the intention to kill the parents 
and to steal belongings. And one of those items may have been a gun, possibly the gun that was used to kill the parents, to shoot the parents that night. Other sources state that they went there with the gun. Now, one thing that is not in question is the this little fact that they were going to use a soda bottle as some type of silencer or suppressor. So this would be to muffle the sounds of the gunshots. Yeah, the fact that they're going to use some man-made concoction to try to silence the gunfire makes it seem more likely to me that they would have done this elsewhere and then brought the gun to the crime scene. The way that this is typically done is you take a two liter plastic bottle or one of those 20 ounce plastic soda bottles. Yeah. Those soda pop and you cut the bottom of it off and you can fasten the bottle to your gun, to the barrel at the end of the barrel of your gun. And a lot of times what I saw online pictures online where people had just duct taped the the bottle to the gun i mean this sounds like something out of the anarchist cookbook here but from the videos that i viewed on youtube when people would do this because it's always been some kind of myth that this actually works as a silencer which you know from our our episode when we talked about the the still unsolved murder up in in michigan right that the the killer comes in with a suppressor. We had suggested maybe that was linked to a case that took place about five or six months prior where somebody stole suppressors and guns from a, a local s- sporting goods store. Right. We learned when we covered that case that in order to get a silencer or a suppressor, you have to request one. You have to buy what it's, it's a stamp, right? And you buy the stamp from the uh, ATF. So you get this stamp and then it's, it's you, you have to purchase the silencer, but you also have to purchase basically a license to have that particular silencer. Meaning that at any time the ATF can knock on your door and say, we want to see your silencer produce it now because you're not allowed to just gift it to somebody or sell it to somebody. And we thought in that case, maybe if you could find the gun or if if that killer believed that a silencer was needed to carry that out because he goes into a business, shoots the attendant, they're connected to other businesses. They're sharing walls at, at this plaza. Right. So here you have people that are trying to sidestep that, right? They don't want to be tied to a silencer. They don't want the government knowing that they purchased a, a suppressor and a lot of times you have to wait a a long a lengthy period of time before you're granted permission to buy the the silencer so people have tried to figure out how can they build their own and i'm sure there's other ways to create one but this is a seemed to be some kind of popular method probably amongst the dumber parts of our communities um because from what i could see captain on youtube it doesn't work at all it does not suppress the sound of the gunshot at all. Well, yeah, the the dumber part of the community or just the naive part of the community. Again, we have to remember that it's a 16 and 17 year old that are planning to take out one of their families. Yeah. And, th- and this is not even a tragedy aside. This is not even really that great of a plan in, in, in my humble gra- garage opinion here. Okay, back to back to the scene. As said, upon entering the home with Brian, McDonald found Bissett's parents lying there with their child, Austin. He's crying. He's touching the parents in an apparent effort to rouse them. Brian told the little boy, his his little brother, that because he was all dirty, covered in blood, that he would need to take a bath. So Brian convinced the boy to leave the room. But before he left, Brian points to his father and said, look, he's still breathing. So McDonald says that he could hear something, something faint. It sounded like air, a breath in and a breath out. But the noise was not coming from where I guess McDonald would expect it to. He then says the the 
the noise was coming from Michael's chest. Yeah, probably coming from a bullet hole. So he's still alive. He's still breathing. The air going in and out through a hole in his chest. Nicholas McDonald says to the detectives that he shot Michael once in the head with Brian Bissett's gun, but claiming that he did so only to end Michael's suffering. And he also states that Wendy was not breathing. Now, how many times do we get a confession? Well, we get multiple confessions from McDonald. So he he's going to confess in Grant's pass. He'll have to be shipped back to the state of Washington for charges there. You know this, and, and the listeners know this. A lot of times when somebody goes to confess, they try to distance themselves from from the actual crime. Well, and you know, that's one reason why when we review unsolved cases and it's clear to us that more than one person was involved, that's why I always go on that. I stand up on the soapbox and shout it from the mountaintop and tell people out there listening, if you're listening to this and you were involved, you were one of the people involved, you should be, be smart, be the first one to pick up the phone or to walk into a police station and tell them what happened. Because, you know, just like with our history books, you know, when there's, when there's a war, guess who gets to write the history of that war? The winner, the, the victor Mm -hmm. gets to write the history books and that's how it was. And that's how it is. You get their perspective and they can sugarcoat things. However they want. Well, same in this scenario. If you speak first, and law enforcement believes you and you can you can back up some of your statements what you say becomes how it went down and that's why i always say if you're involved in something especially nowadays we're talking about the the golden age of dna and solving cases cold cases a lot of times if they got the evidence what we're seeing today is that it's it's only a matter of time before they make the arrest and charge you be the first one to to create the narrative of how it went down and who's responsible for what. Right. Because this is how it goes down. The criminal then goes to detectives or law enforcement. They strike up a deal or basically say, Hey, confess to us and then we'll work this out. The detectives are the ones that feed the information to the prosecution. So then to feed that information to the prosecution, they will tend to protect the person that gave the confession. I mean, obviously, if there's more than one, more than one perpetrator. Well, and this is a, a very intriguing case and a very intriguing true crime story. But as the listeners have already figured out, there's not a ton of mystery here. And what we're going to see is when this does go to trial, we're going to have two guys committed these crimes together, these murders together, but one will be charged differently than the other right we can get into some of the confession stuff and the the way that that's going to work and play out as after we get through the confession here so we now have according to our confessor where we're at in our story is that that unfortunately michael and wendy have both been killed mcdonald implicating himself as being involved directly involved in michael's death if you're sensitive, you're probably not listening to this show, but if, if, if you are, you might want to skip ahead about 30 seconds or 40 seconds. Well, I'm very sensitive. You pray because this is when this horrible, horrible situation just gets even worse. If you can even imagine it getting worse, it, it here, here it goes. Um, Nicholas McDonald said that when he left the room, uh, he believed that both the parents were dead by this point, And then he walked he went into the bathroom. This is where he finds Brian with his little brother, Austin. Brian, according to McDonald, had filled up the bathtub with, with water. Austin had stripped off of his bloody clothes. And according to McDonald, now Brian has the gun. And it was he, McDonald, that was going to have to kill the boy. McDonald told the detectives that, quote, he then went into the bathroom and that Bissett was waiting just outside the door and that he feared Bissett would shoot him. So he held the boy under the water face down until he drowned. Horrific stuff. What do we think of this confession so far here, Captain? Like I was saying before, normally when the person is confessing, 
they start and and you can see in his uh, initial part of the story i well i didn't even enter the house i entered the house after the crime and the murders already were taking place and then he obviously shows his involvement with the killing of the father but this is where i think you'd have to believe him more is because he then tells you well i i drowned the little brother and um but i mean just it's uh, it's unimaginable horrific. let's just be honest we were all teenagers at one point we all struggle maybe not all of us but i know me and you did you struggle with authority figures a little bit and who's the number one authority figures in right. your life your parents and there's a part of you that it's like just get off my back don't tell me what to do i don't i don't need your advice i'm going to live my life i want to hang out with my friends but and i've known friends of mine that it's gotten really intense and 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 over the line as far as their relationship with their parents gone i was lucky that that never took place never got to that level with, with my parents where they kicked me out of the house or that i was basically like living on my own or living on the streets but you could understand why somebody would be upset with their parents but to want to harm them to want to murder them it just it doesn't make a lot of sense no no sense at all it's incredibly difficult to try to wrap your head around this situation and of course this confession that they've heard so far is going to springboard several actions into play that will have a domino effect right first things first there is one fast way you you need to confirm if this story is true because it's not every day, thank God, that some kid just walks into a police station and says, hey, me and my friend, we just killed three people. So now you have to do two things that you need to sort out really quickly. One, he's saying that he did not do this alone, so you need to go find the other killer. Two, you need to locate the people that he is talking about to see, one, if either they are perfectly fine and this kid is lying or or just out of his mind or locate their bodies and go through the crime scene and build a case against the, the confessor. McDonald tells the police that he drove off on his own with the bodies of Michael and Austin and that he hid their bodies along a logging road, which was about three miles from the home from the murder house. He also helped Brian hide Wendy's body in the pump house that was adjoining their home. I believe this was for a well. And that both of them cleaned the house after the murders to try to conceal evidence of the killings. Then they take Brian's parents' van and they take off. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, hel dot garage. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D-printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. 
Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. At Consumer Cellular, you get the same exact coverage as the largest carriers, but for up to half the cost. Same thing, up to half the cost. Up to half the cost for the same thing. 50% the money for 100% the same thing. I hope I'm making myself clear. Consumer Cellular. When freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Half the cost savings based on cost of Consumer Cellular single-line 5 gigabyte data plan with unlimited talk and text compared to lowest cost single-line postpaid unlimited talk text and data plan offered by T-Mobile and Verizon in May 2023. All right, we are back. Thanks for joining us here in the garage. Thanks for sharing these cases on social media. It keeps the show going. Colonel, cheers to you. Cheers to you, Captain. And cheers to all the people that have already bought their tickets for the BrewDog Live event coming up April 29th. My birthday bash. Yeah, if you're going to be attending, this is the Captain's Birthday Bash. We will be celebrating together, and the event includes your ticket includes a beer tasting with yours truly with the colonel and the captain so we'll all get a little crispy together Mm -hmm. make sure you have a meal beforehand don't have a bunch of drinks before you sit down because we'll have some drinks during the show and we can't wait to see all of you april 29th yeah and if you haven't been to this brew dog location it's absolutely fabulous and you're gonna love the location so. You might want to get there early. You can eat there. You can have dinner there. Uh, it's an incredible location. You'll want to hang out there. There's games to play. My favorite uh, recreational game, pinball. They got plenty of good pinball machines there. And we will. Well, do you know why you like pinball? Because I'm a pinball wizard. Because you're a pinhead. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and we and we want to hang out after the show and have a beer with you guys as well. So. Hope to see you there April 29th. If you're looking for a ticket, I believe there's still some available on our website on the store page. Wouldn't that be mean if we said, hey, come join us and then they go, <laughs> it's all sold out. If it is, my apologies. Later that morning, th- see, this is what's strange to me. There's a lot of a lot of strange parts of this case, but thankfully, this Nicholas McDonald seems to, to grow a a heart you know like the grinch he's got a tiny little heart and then it grew bigger to normal size and he he feels some remorse obviously because he walks into the police station confesses to what just took place hours before and keep in mind the reason why the confession i think is it's it's a complete 180 you know life turns on a dime sometimes without notice and what we have is just just hours earlier he and his friend are going to great lengths and great efforts to conceal the triple homicide that they just committed. And now he's walking into the police station in Grants Pass, Oregon, and implicated his 16-year-old friend, Brian Bissett, in the shooting deaths of Brian Bissett's parents. So Grants Pass Police, they then notify Grays Harbor County. The, The two killers are not from this area where he's at confessing right so they notify grays harbor county sheriff's officers who then discover the bodies on friday afternoon that afternoon his accomplice brian Bissett, police find brian Bissett exactly where mcdonald tells them they will find him he leads police to brian who is sleeping in the van in his parents van that they stole after committing the murders at a gas station that is basically across the street from the the police station. I was hoping that you were going to say that he was sleeping in the van down by the river. But like you said, they're confessing to this crime, but not where the crime took place locally. So they're going to have to call in the local law enforcement 
to handle this case. Yeah, that's right. They are from some tiny city called McClary, which is in Gray's Harbor County or Gray Harbor County, excuse me, Washington. The population there in 1995, when our case took place, is roughly 1,200 people. And this is like a beautiful, small, wonderful community. Law enforcement and now this professed and confessed killer are sitting in a room at Grants Pass Police Station about 370 miles south of McClary in the great state of Oregon. That's a six-hour drive from where they committed these crimes. McClary is a small city, not just in population, but in size as well. It's described as a western Washington town just a few blocks long. Right. From what I could find, Captain, it looks like McClary is just 2.05 square miles. And to give you an idea of the location, McClary is about 80 miles southwest of Seattle following I-5. Brian and McDonald were brought back from Oregon to Washington on that Saturday. So they commit the murders very early Friday morning by 8 to 9 a.m. McDonald's in the Grants Pass police station confessing to the crimes. They arrest Brian. They find the bodies. And by Saturday, the following day, they are transporting the two suspects back to Washington. Following this, Unfortunately, we have the funeral for three members of the Bissett family. Most people in the town of 1200 knew the Bissets, and more than half of the city turned out for the funeral. Again, both murderers are young, 16 and 17. So you have the 17 year old confessing. Then they bring in Brian, the 16 year old. It's It was his family that they killed. You'd think that they'd be it'd be pretty easy for them to get him to confess as well. Well, and that's why I think that we have multiple confessions from McDonald because when they arrest Brian, you know, they're telling him like, look, your friend told us everything that that you guys did. Right. And, oh yeah, we found the gun. We found the bodies. uh, We found the, the, we've gone through the scene. And so I'm sure Brian told them some other version of the same story. Right. And then you go back to McDonald and say, okay, well, you know, a lot of what you're saying checks out, but some of it does not. Uh, Let's go through this again. And so you go through it a a few times with each of the suspects to try to sort out what in the end you believe ultimately happened and how and what the prosecutors are going to attempt to charge and convict both of these people with. Well, and it gets more complicated, too, again, because of their age. For our victims here, we have Austin, who was remembered as a bright and charming little boy who helped his grandmother plant zucchini in the summer leading up to the night in question. And he was known to jump from lap to lap at ball games when he was in attendance watching uh, ball games because we have older siblings who participated in sports. After the funeral service, 18-year-old Stephanie Bissett, who lived at the at the Bissett family home and through the grace of God just happened not to be there that night, she held a rose and a flag at the after the service as she cried and smiled, graciously accepting condolences and hugs from dozens and dozens of family friends. The only direct mention of Brian at the funeral or at the services came when someone read a list of survivors. I thought you were going to say when somebody read a list of pieces of shit. So other than that, he was not discussed at this service and rightfully so the Bissett family, they were buried in wooden caskets with Austin sharing a casket with his, his mother, the victims, as we said, were Michael Allen Bissett born 1951, Wendy Gale lamb Bissett date of birth, August 12, 1954. So she was killed by her son the day before her 41st birthday. And we have the little boy, Austin Edward Bissett, born in 1989. He was just five years old. The Bissets had been together and experienced over 20 years of marriage together. And it sounds like they were still very much in love. They wrote little love notes to each other often. 
Michael worked for the Simpson Timber Company in Shelton. He was very active in youth sports. He coached T-ball and Little League over the years. He refereed grade and high school basketball games. Mm -hmm. He played slow pitch softball. He was a graduate of Elma High School. This is where he met his future wife, Wendy. Wendy was a former dental hygienist before being a homemaker. She sold crafts and babysat for extra money. They had five kids, three daughters. We mentioned Stephanie, 18, who was out of town for a softball tournament at the time of the killings. Two older girls, two older daughters who were grown women and out of the house by 1995 and did not live with them. Little Austin loved berry picking and named his, this is like heartbreaking and sad and cute all at the same time. He named his dogs and cats after friends of his uh, from from school. Yeah, I mean, in these cases, it's it's when you have, um, whether it's a school shooter or you have a teenager that harms a friend or harms his family, he, he, it, the question always becomes nature or nurture. And in this situation, you have a, a family that had five children and it seems like all the other children other than brian were were good people yeah and what it looks like to me is you have this kind of snake eating itself situation right the snake eating its tail where it looks to me like when brian would get in trouble for something like he was starting to go down the wrong path and when he would get in trouble for something his his reaction was to push back against mom and dad for punishing him. And this creates this, this scenario where he's always in trouble and elevating the consequences for his actions because he's he's just constantly fighting back against the authority. Right. So our perpetrators, Brian Michael Bissett age 16 and Nicolaus James McDonald age 17. Some sources say that McDonald was 18. I believe that is because he was 18 by the time this thing went to trial. Friends and family say Brian was a quiet and shy kid, average student. He went to Elma high school where his parents went faculty there say that they saw no evidence of anger with this kid, but he did drop out of, of high school. So they, there would be a period of time that they, the faculty would not have known or had interaction with, with Brian. Right. The principal at Elma High said that he checked Brian's records and found no disciplinary actions except truancy. And he said he didn't seem to enjoy school and dropped out last April. The, the homicides took place in August. Michael Keating, this was Brian's biology teacher, said that Brian was a decent student. Quote, I was amazed he could keep up with his studies despite his truancy problems, end quote. So he he didn't, sounds like he didn't show up a lot, but when he did, he was able to do the work, get passing grades. Right. About a year before the murders, Brian started changing. This is according to friends of the family. Mm -hmm. And according to Wendy's brother-in-law, Brian's mother's brother-in-law, Ed Olson, he said that Brian started hanging out with the wrong crowd, and this wrong crowd included McDonald. Michelle Brown dated Brian for about a month. This was about a year before the murders. She's quoted in some newspaper articles uh, as talking about Brian. One thing, she said that she broke up with Brian when he started getting into alcohol, and she says that he got into alcohol real bad, so bad that on one occasion, Brian had to be hospitalized for alcohol poisoning. We also wonder what's going on with his mental state. You know, again, chicken or the egg, is he having some mental issues that he starts self-medicating or just, oh, I'm I'm a teenager. I'm going to experiment with uh, drugs or alcohol, and then that causes mental issues. And so, and sometimes it's both, right? And, uh, and, and the person doesn't even know what they're doing. Right. But again, this is, this is interesting here, I think, because she says that they broke up about a year before. I don't know how much interaction or what their relationship was after the breakup, but she does state that 
he had a lot of anger towards his parents, but she says she never knew why, never understood why. So this is somebody that likely met his parents and does not agree with whatever Brian, you know, the, the, the anger. And we can even say the word hate right. toward his parents. Well, he, was, I think hate that is, he was expressing to her and to others. Yeah. I think hate would be the appropriate term. Wendy's brother-in-law, Ed Olson said that Brian's behavior had gotten so violent in the weeks leading up to the murders that Wendy started sleeping with a baseball bat next to her bed. Well, you know, like you said, when the conflict was, was happening uh, evidence of this evidence of his story being true is she came after her son with a baseball bat yeah and wendy's mom said that quote they tried to get help they tried to get counseling and even asked the sheriff's department if they could put him meaning brian in juvenile hall right nothing was working so they kicked him out of the house now there are some conflicting reports here captain some say that the parents kicked brian out of the house about a week before the murders because of his increasingly violent behavior. But other reports state that he was kicked out weeks before. And one statement that was made, this is according to several friends and family that Brian actually threatened to kill his parents the week before the actual murders, right? Not knowing the story firsthand, experiencing any of this firsthand. I think Brian likely was kicked out, several weeks in advance and you know how these things work out i think he was actually kicked out multiple times yeah i sometimes you're kicked out and then you're let back in and then you're kicked out again um this is what we'd call uh escalation as uh dave Chappelle would say a habitual line stepper yeah right so well and it's weird though too because i i don't know if you've saw this in reports but it seemed like brian occasionally was like staying in their shed like when he couldn't figure out where to go and not wanting to deal with his parents or not knowing how to deal with his parents, he would just camp out in their shed. Well, and I'm using air quotes here. Uh, he would break into the house. Hmm. That's why I think he might've been out for multiple weeks leading up to the murders, because there's a report that the week prior, the week before the murders, he broke into his parents' home. This was when, so the family went on a vacation that week that would make sense because there's no school at this time they go on vacation but his sister who's 18 stayed at the house i don't know if she had things to do with softball or with friends or what have you but she stays at the house and that's how they know that he broke into the house because she's able to report that that he broke into the house the week before Mm -hmm. and so this method of using the ladder to climb up to the second story window i think was something that he had done multiple times now when we talk about how long had he had been kicked out of the house or outdoors i'm wondering if part of this stemmed from a report that i found that said that he broke into his grandmother's house and stole a gun and remember we're talking about the parents the parents are telling people like we kick him out because he's violent he's hostile we're afraid of him. Are they afraid of him because they know that he stole a gun from one of their, one of their parents' homes? Yeah. And like you said, he was making threats. I mean, this is, this would be a very difficult situation for any parent. You want to protect your kid, but now you have to protect your wife. You got to protect your younger son, or you're going to try to, because your teenage son is threatening everybody. But how very Joey Potter of him to have that ladder go up to the second story and so he can climb into Dawson's window right and I mean you can kind of take a look at this and see it from his perspective he probably thought that he was unjustly kicked out of his parents home which I mean nobody wants violence in their home but you don't want to be looking over your shoulder in your own house because you're afraid of your violent teenage son yeah you're your violent douche muffin Vienna Seymour this is a friend of the Bissett family She was asked about Brian's increasingly out of control behavior, and she had this to say, quote, it was a known fact he was a little out of control, but there's out of control and then there's killing your parents, end quote. Nicholas McDonald, age 17, moved to the town of McClary from Illinois. I believe it was a year or two before the murders took place, so I don't think he was there 
a great deal of time, but I could not confirm when he, when he moved to McClary. He too was a high school dropout. Mark Keating, biology teacher said of McDonald quote, he was a good kid and I liked him. I saw him about a week ago and he had a job in a local restaurant and talked about saving money to buy a car. He seemed happy End quote, he had gone to an alternative school after he dropped out and earned his high school equivalency diploma. Pat Bodine, a Bissett family friend who used to work with McDonald, said, quote, Nikolaus was a strange kid with a bad reputation in town. Some reports say that the two were friends, and some reports say that they were boyfriends, that there was something else going on with the relationship between McDonald and Brian Bissett. So much more to get to in this case. Please join us back here in the garage. Same bat time, same bat channel. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D-printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go.